lot of people think that they get a job making a bunch of money and uh, are able to buy like all the toys they want and stuff, they'll be happy. But <laughs> yeah. Turns out not. He's good for that, that curing that kind of ailment. Mm -hmm. I haven't read all of his book yet. I'm in the middle of it right now. I'm going to try and finish it before the 14th so I can ask smart questions instead of stupid questions. It's called um, Symboling on Happiness. I'm only into like 100 pages. I've got to finish it before. All of this, a lot of this, the surveys do to people and they ask them how happy they are. It's kind of, yeah. it's like those, pe a lot of people that live in like isolated rural villages, living on subsistence farming, they might be happy about it just because they have lower expectations from life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they've never tasted so like haagen ice cream. It's so, hard so they don't know what they're missing. Happiness anyways, but you can find happiness by not even doing it. Oh, and we're back. So, um, more about uh, oh evolution, about the theory of evolution. So, um, Darwinian evolution, this idea of natural selection, it, uh, it's basically the idea you get a random mutation. So you have like uh, cosmic rays is some sort of organism like a little amoeba or something and you have uh, cosmic rays come down radiation oops uh, where's my eraser there it is it's Alexia dyslexics of the world untie Cause, cosmic rays. So it's just radiation, and then this causes uh, mutation, a ra random mutation. And again, most of the time, it's going to be bad. You'll get some useless thing, or the organism will just die. There's just like little errors in the DNA. But sometimes, so you get like bad, bad ones here, but sometimes you get a good one, and then. Um, it, it builds, so you get like some little thing, like uh, some little appendage. Maybe it's uh, a little weird growth that's sensitive to light, and maybe if a predator like is swimming over you and blocks out the light, you see, oh, that's weird. There's a sensation of the predator, and then the predator's on you, and you get away, and you're like, oh, every time the light's blocked out, I better run away. And then maybe you produce more with this sort of little weird growth. And then eventually, again, over millions and millions of years, you get something like an eye. And, but it's over this long process. And each time you get a positive change, it gets locked into the gene pool and it proliferates. It gets selected for. You get more and more of it. And the idea is that once you start out with, say, bacteria, that um, it's just a matter of time from bacteria or the first the first one-celled animal to getting things as complex as human beings, you just need a lot of time and a lot of mutations. And, um, and so that's, that's sort of how, that's why things look like they're designed even though they're not according to evolutionary theorists. So you get what's, the, the, what's called the, uh, the blind watchmaker. which is uh, so put the, the blind watch. And this is what Dawkins calls um, uh, evolution or natural selection. So it's like the, the designer, uh, the, the watchmaker, except for there's no mind required. What, what explains the apparent design of the world? Well, again, it's this natural mechanical processes. And evolution gives a mechanism which can show how simple, random mechanical processes could have created all the order, complexity, and purpose we observe in the world. Thoughts on that, on evolution as an alternative explanation? Is it enough to explain everything? Is it, are there any weaknesses or things that are missing? 
from it as an explanation. A lot of people said, why is, if that was true, why is the monkey not turning into us still? Good question. Why are there still bacteria? Why do we still have, uh, why do we still have, um, um, actually the, the hominids actually died out uh, that we came from, but uh, why are there the great apes and why, you know, anybody have an answer to that? Why, why do we still have bacteria and cockroaches and all those things? Yeah. For the uh, complex ecosystem, I guess each level of evolution can be argued as a tier, so only a certain percentage would evolve to the next level and so on and so on. Yes, yeah, so you have the notion of an ecological niche. Ecological. Would it be a genetic anomaly? Like why certain things evolve and certain other ones do it in the same race or type of uh, species? Um, well, you have whole species that you know die out. So why is that? Well, they weren't. You know, it's survival of the fittest, right? So they weren't fit for survival, something happened where they weren't able to adapt and change. Like the dinosaurs died out, it's thought because um, when, a, um, when a meteor hit the earth, it uh, caused a huge cloud of dust that blocked out the uh, sun coming down, and then plants didn't grow as well, and the dinosaurs' food supply dried up. That was one theory. And because they're such large animals, they required a lot of food, and they ended up dying out and going extinct. Uh, whereas smaller animals uh, survived. So that, yeah, so it is all a matter of like what kind of you know, animal you are and what your genes, you know, your genes will determine that. And the, the animals which have the best survival capacity uh, live the longest and reproduce the most. And so the, the, the question though is why do we still have these simpler forms of life? Why didn't they evolve too? And it's because they found some sort of equilibrium with their environment where their environment was pretty much staying the same and there's no reason for them to change. The only reason you change is if there's a change in your environment you have to adapt. And again, I'm using, you know, have to, uh, you know, need to, that sort of design type language. But what happens, like if you're, if you're a cockroach, you're adapted to pretty much any environment. And so the, you're, if you're in a niche where you can get all the food you want, you can reproduce like crazy, oops, in a wide variety of environments, then that you have like a lot, actually a lot of niches. But you think about like a fish. Why doesn't a fish you know, turn into a frog? Well, because the fish is able to reproduce and live in its environment and it doesn't have any uh, uh, trouble um, surviving. There's no no major threats to its survival, and so it just sort of stays stuck in that area. And maybe minor changes over time, so you might get differences in color, differences in size, and so on, but within that species, there's not um, that much change over time. And it's only when you get like changes in the environment that it causes stress on, stresses on organisms where an ev a, 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 a mutation might do you some good. And so that, the, the notion of an ecological niche explains why we still have the simpler, simpler animals. Human contact has definitely influenced uh, the survival of certain species, and, and like even in this, like I remember hearing the story about when they first had the oil industry and the refineries, and there's that this town. This sounds like a tangent. Uh, it's kind of the same thing, but my, it's okay. Are you talking about those moss or the moss? moss that, yes. Okay. You knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just wanted to stay, make sure we stay, stay on task. So, so what's what's the deal with these moths? It basically, is, uh, that's the half of the, uh, the some of them got eaten. Well, half of them were like dark, some uh -huh. and then the smut from the oil got onto the got into the environment, and they were able to blend in. And so the darker ones survived, and the lighter ones died. Right. So the idea is you have these moths, and they sort of blend in. With, they they um, didn't. You get uh, industrial pollution. I think it was from coal, actually, yeah, exactly. and then it gets it gets onto the trees and turns into this sort of ashy color. And so what happens is these moss, which are an ashy color, get more ashy looking. So they blend in with the tree and then they proliferate. Whereas the dark colored moss all died out. So it's evolution in, in action, given as an, an example. Um, I'm not sure whether that example has been debunked or not. I've seen like. I've seen a lot of uh, discussion about whether that's actually a legitimate example of microevolution or not. But certainly, you, 
that sort of mechanism is the kind of mechanism that is thought to be behind evolutionary adaptation. So it was relevant. Yes, it was. Thank you. It was just a, it was I just wasn't sure where it was going. I was there. Uh, so what about what about this idea of um, what if you want to argue that God God created evolution? I hear people say that a lot. You said that earlier. Yeah, I, I think that's a, if you're religious or you know you believe in God and it, it was proven that evolution of the Big Bang Theory was exactly how it happened, you would say, well, God made it happen. That would be the natural <coughs> response if you really believed in God. And it would be fun. So what is this? So what does this do? Does this like, um, is this a good comeback? Does this defeat the, the argument that evolution proves there is no God and that the design argument is doesn't work anymore? Yes? I was just say, all it does really is poke holes in the Bible. It doesn't really poke holes in the existence of God. Yeah. Hmm. So the interpretation of Genesis and it's only like rolling around thousands of years, it might be that the timeline interpretation of the Bible would be inaccurate. Yeah, it could be just that you know, justice is meant to be figurative or poetical or something, and not intended to be a little scientific treatise on creation. So, and there, you know, there are some Christians that of the liberal sort that that believe in um, believe in evolution. Actually, the Catholic Church has endorsed the theory of evolution, for example, and that's like about like a quarter of all Christians in America. Um, so, but if you suppose you know religious, particular religious beliefs aside, what if you say, well, um, I can still have my design argument because, you know, God must have designed the evolutionary uh, process. Is that a good comeback for the theist? Or somebody like Dawkins going to say about that? Is Dawkins in this chapter? I think I just, um, I don't know if I mentioned him in the book. He's a good name, though. Richard Dawkins. He's the guy that cr that coined the phrase of blind watchmaker. I think I might have just mentioned him in passing. He wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker. Or it was one of the answers that could have been. Okay, yeah, may, may have been a fake answer. Yeah? I keep coming back to my question of, like, why would he create evolution if he is perfect? Why wouldn't he just create everything perfect? Because he knows all. Yeah. So, is an imperfection. I, I think <laughs> yes. that exploration is amazing. I mean, it's it's perfect to me. I, I suppose if, you know, if human beings start out sort of ready-made the way God wanted them to end up, then there's no sort of process for us to go through, and we don't make choices. No trials, tribulations, no free will. We can go on and on about that. Yeah, it sort of gets into the problem of evil. See, um, is there a question here to... I had a hand go up. You think? Well, why does God have to be perfect for the argument? Isn't that the definition? Of God? I think it's like part of the definition of God is this yeah. uh, perfect being, kind of ultimate being. It seems like if God is really the designer of the universe, that and you say, well, God just created the, the theory of evolution. And this sort of, I guess, this gets or not the theory of evolution, but the process of evolution. That 
if God wanted to create a world that seems like a really weird way to do it, <laughs> it seems like it's inelegant, right? It's like, why, if he wanted, like all the, the variety of plants and animals and so on that we see, why didn't he just design them and create them the way they are? But it seems like they've gone through this long process of, of uh, evolution. Uh, and maybe this will get, maybe we'll hit a couple of other uh, counter arguments because this, this following the subjection further gets us a little more into the the uh, problem of evil. Um, how about some other objections? Or how about let me just uh, uh, on this idea that God created evolution? Um, it seems like. Even if you say God created evolution, that might be a consistent belief, but it's not necessary. So um, if you just admit that evolution could work on, on purely natural random processes, it might be compatible with God's existence, but it's also possible that it, that it happened and God doesn't exist. So in other words, um, God may be compatible with evolution. I mean, isn't that kind of already proven that we have evolved stuff like where we see Neanderthals and those other Homo sapiens or whatever they how we ever became who we are now from the other forms of humans. Mm -hmm. So technically, we We're have almost. evolved. Our brains are going are going to eventually evolve. They say that. I don't know, it's called the neurosphere or something. Eventually, our brains will evolve and we'll be able to be a telepathic being. But, I mean, I guess technically, how did we become Homo sapiens like when they found Neanderthals and all those other forms of humans? Right, so um, you have like the, the fossil record. You see animals that look a lot like, you know, apes. They're called hominids. And then as you go further down the fossil record, you can see, as we get closer and closer to modern times, you see beings that, that look kind of like us with like a, a big jaw and a sloping brow and then the brow goes up a little bit and the neck and you dig into the next strata and you see the jaws in a little bit and instead of being hunched over they're walking upright until you go through like Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon man and you know and finally get to Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens sapiens which is uh, the our species. Our yeah, and it looks like modern man, you know, went through this process of change going back to the Australopithecines, I guess, or some of the earliest ones, and uh, Homo habilis and all those early ones that looked very ape-like to modern humans who, who look uh, different, but you can see the, the family resemblance and all the intermittent changes. And so we're like the transitionary forms where you can see like all these differences in the species of of man-like beings, and you get the really primitive ape-like looking ones, and then you get the, the ones that look more like humans as you go further in time towards uh, modern man. So assuming that that's the way things happened, then you could still believe in God and believe that God made man, but he used the monkey to do it, to quote a song from Devo. <laughs> uh, Line, line from uh, a song called Jocko Homo, which is all about evolution. But, uh, but you know, God made man, but he used the process of evolution uh, to do it. But then, where is the design argument? It seems like the design argument just has all the air sucked out of it. Because if I can explain human beings without needing a God, then it seems like the design argument's lost all its force. Adam and Eve. I mean, the Bible is more than a design argument that created Adam and Eve. Not necessarily. You don't have to believe in Adam and Eve to believe in the design argument. Huh. You could believe, again, that God designed human beings and and did it through the series, <clears throat> through the theory of or through the process of evolution. But as soon as you admit that you can have evolution just through natural. Uh, selection, random mutation and natural selection, the design argument doesn't work anymore. So God may be compatible with evolution, but um, have to get a new page. But um, if you admit um, 
random selection. Uh, random selection. It should say natural. Sorry, natural. Random mutation and natural selection. I mean, I'll just put in evolution. Sorry. Um, if you admit. Try this one more time. Okay. Sorry. Random mutation and natural selection. So if you admit random mutation and natural selection, um, can produce order uh, design argument loses um, its force. It loses its credibility. In other words, you you say you could say, well, look, how did we get all the variety of plants and animals and how do the bees do their thing and create their beehives? And uh, Dawkins can say, well, it's the process of evolution. Um, random mutation, natural selection. And a person could say, well, oh yeah, well, I believe that God created the theory of evolution, or God created the process of evolution. And um, just because there's random mutation and natural selection doesn't mean there isn't a God. And Dawkins can say, okay, sure, that's fine. But you can't tell me that there has to be a God because of the wonders of nature anymore. Because the one, I've just explained the wonders of nature. The wonders of nature happen through random mutation and natural selection. I don't need God anymore. And so the design argument says, if you look at nature, it cries out for a designer. And that you can't, you can't look at the complexity of nature and not believe that there's a God. Well, what Dawkins says is that, look, I've just explained the complexity of nature. You don't need to believe in God anymore. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a God. It just means that you don't need a God to explain the complexity of nature. So kind of a subtle point. Uh, anybody have any questions about that or follow-ups or want me to repeat it in different words? Pretty thorough. Okay, let, me, let me try it one more way, uh, just to make sure everybody's got it. So you can believe in God and evolution, but you can't prove God with design if evolution can explain the design. Remember, the design argument is trying to prove there's a God. How does it do it? It points to nature and says, look at all this order and complexity and purpose. How could you have order, complexity, and purpose without a mind which designs it? Therefore, there must be an infinite intelligence, a God who created all this order, complexity, and purpose, who designed the world. And then um, evolutionary biologists come along and say, we can explain all this design. Here's how it happened. And they tell you all about natural selection. And then you say, okay, well, that explains nature. And then um, where is belief in God now? Well, you could still believe in God, and you could believe that God was somehow behind the, the process of evolution. But you don't need to believe in God anymore. God becomes an extraneous hypothesis. So although evolution doesn't disprove God's existence, it takes away an argument in favor of God's existence. I may all write that down, because that sounds even more clear. Evolution doesn't disprove God. but it uh, removes an argument in favor of God. So what about Christian scientists? Hmm? Now that sounds like a tangent. <laughs> well, they believe, in, they believe in evolution and that God created evolution. Well, you can still believe in it. It's just saying that you can well, use it as your proof. Uh, Christian scientists don't believe in the material world, so... <laughs> 
Oh, no, no, that's a Christian Wait, science. Okay. It's like uh, Christianity meets Eastern, Eastern mysticism. But yeah, so they're just one example of a, 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 a group that believes in um, evolution and believes in God. And a lot of people that believe in kind of a generic God, like, I don't know, like a deist, uh, a mason, you know, people. There's people in America that don't have any particular religious belief, but they believe in kind of a generic God. So, the, and those people also tend to believe in evolution as well um, because they don't have any religious dogma they're trying to support about like God, you know, Adam and Eve being a special creation by God and so on. So many people believe in both God and evolution. But uh, the point is that evolution takes away the design argument. It just sucks the air out of it. It makes it um, uh, ineffective because it's saying, here's this thing that you need to explain. If you can't explain it, you have to use God to explain it. And you say, every time you see this, there's got to be that. Every time you see order, complexity, and purpose, there has to be a designer. Order, complexity, and purpose are just another way of describing design. So every time you see design, there has to be a designing mind, says the, the design argument. But uh, evolution says, no, here we, I can explain the design through these random mechanical processes. If I can do that, then you don't need God. Uh, some ca some counter arguments from David Hume from the reading. Um, so he says the universe is not like a, a, a watch, but the universe is like a vegetable <laughs> like a giant tomato <laughs> a giant potato <laughs> a giant turnip or what have you right so and it, so he says the universe is a vegetable how how do vegetables reproduce well um reproduce through um, he used the word vegetation <laughs> which is sort of weird and circular um, you think about like uh, uh, dropping seeds so what is it uh, comes before germination what do you call it when a plant gives off seeds oh, like metamorphosis or something <laughs> that's, that's uh, something else I'll just put um, through seeds. I'll just put seeds. Google it for you if you want. Googling some things like that can be actually hard because you got to know what you're looking for. Um, so the universe, uh, so, so vegetables produced by seeds, therefore the universe came from a seed. So this is like a counter analogy. He says, okay, well, you have the analogy of the watch, I have the analogy of the turnip, <laughs> the analogy of the squash, the analogy of the pumpkin, right? So every time you, you know, what happens when you have a plant? Well, like it drops its seeds, they go into the ground, and they produce new, new plants, right? That's, that's how plants reproduce. Well, why can't I use this as my model for the universe? Why do I have to use like a mind? Because there, the order, complexity, and purpose in the tomato, where does it come from? It comes from other tomatoes. So why this analogy, and Hume says this analogy is just as good as the, uh, the analogy of the watch. The universe came from a giant uh, seed of some kind. And you can think about, you know, the, the idea that it might be like, a universe and something might happen where a part of the universe would sort of break off and contain all the principles of order in that universe and it would sort of evolve into the universe we live in now. So it's an analogy. So it doesn't mean that 
you know, that the universe has, like leaves or the universe breathes carbon dioxide, any more than with the watchmaker analogy that you could find, like, the gears and, like, what's the spring of the world? That you'd have to, like, you'd find some spring in the cosmos, that, like, that's the spring and that's the gear. So it's an analogy. So not all, all parts of the, the thing that's, that's being analogized are going to fit with something in the universe. And then he has a, another one, which is, he says, well, what, suppose the universe isn't like an a animal. Suppose the universe is like a plant. Or, sorry, like an animal. <coughs> like an animal. Suppose the universe is like an animal. <laughs> Animals reproduce through, well, you know, birds do it, bees do it, flowers do it, trees do it. Actually, no, I, that's mixing with the last metaphor. Um, the universe is like uh, an animal. Animals um, reproduce through procreation. Oops, procreation. Therefore, the universe is a product of procreation. Universe came from procreation. I'm gonna abbreviate. <laughs> so what happened? Mommy and Daddy Universe got together and they produced Baby Universe. <laughs> and Hume says, "Okay, Ma, you might say this is a ridiculous analogy." Uh, but how is this any worse than the watch analogy? The idea that two universes sort of had some kind of interaction that produced a third universe. We see it like animals, and animals, uh, where does the order of, um, of a little kitten come from? How did it get its, uh, it, you know, its fur and its paws and its uh, cute little purr and all the, the you know, the, the tail and, and its stru kitten structure and all its behaviors, where did it come from? Well, it came from its parents, right? Its, two, its parents had, had uh, uh, sexual reproduction and the mother gave birth to the kitten. And there's the kitten and it recapitulates all the uh, um, structures in its parents, its genetic structure. Well, why couldn't the universe be like that? So, that, so Hume offers these two counter analogies, not because he's trying to offer like a, a real alternative explanation. He just <coughs> says that the analogy is weak and these, these counter analogies are equally as valid, but you know, I think the idea is that these are ridiculous, but can you think, and so just, if you think these are ridiculous, you ought to think the watch analogy is ridiculous too. That's why he made these analogies to kind of prove or just make you think about the other analogies. Right, yeah, so what? Now, what if, um, what if you try to say, well, look, God designed the vegetables and the animals, too. So the, these analogies aren't any good. Like, where, where, did the, where did the order in the tomato come from? Well, and that's sort of begging the question, though. You're, you're assuming, oh, that it has to be a mind that designed it. And Hume has this great phrase where he says, um, you know, what, what is it about human beings that we, we have this, uh, just because we have a mind, we think we have to make it the pattern of the universe. And Hume thinks that, that this idea of the designer, this, this infinite intelligence, is human projection. It's um, the idea that whatever created the universe has to be a giant version of us. And so we're, what, when we design things, it comes from the human mind. And so we think, oh, where, where did the universe come from? And it has to be like a superhuman mind. But that's just you know, hubris. It's, it's uh, a human pride and folly to think that the universe has to measure up to uh, our model of it instead of you know, looking at the universe objectively. We think, oh, I create things with my mind, therefore whatever created me has to have a mind that's like mine. And he says that's a, a, 
sort of a biased, subjective way of looking at things. Um, other, can you think of other arguments against the um, design argument? What about like, um, it's coming back to like this idea if you were gonna design a world, if you were an omnipotent being and you had all knowledge, is this the best you could do? <laughs> and Hume actually talks about, you know, that basically that God is, is um, you know, if, if there is a designer, He's either malevolent. Uh, actually, I'll let me leave this, make this second. He's either incompetent or malevolent. Sorry to make you erase again. Incompetent. Or malevolent. So what do you think he means by this? Who said this? Uh, this is Hume. I think he's in common because think about like, <laughs> <laughs> you think about the atmosphere and how uh -huh. it protects us. Like if, <laughs> even if a meteor comes into it, I guess sometimes, most of the time, it, our atmosphere will burn it up. Or you know, how it itself, you know, it heals itself. And it has for millions and more billions of years, I guess. So I mean, in a sense, Except for that one that wiped out the dinosaurs. We, we, yeah, well. And the one that hit the Ruskies, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, or a week ago. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. That <laughs> yeah, probably wasn't so awesome if you were the living The video there. was. Okay, yeah, I mean, the video was cool. I agree with that. But yeah, I think about, okay, so the atmosphere, you know, protect us, except for that one that wiped out the dinosaurs, and occasionally, they think like the Gulf of Mexico was probably created by a meteor. So they get it on occasion, but maybe the atmosphere, like, screens out most of them okay but think about like what parts are like are of the earth are habitable really i mean it, i was like outside today, I'm like damn i gotta bring my umbrella again and it's like freezing cold outside and and it's pouring down rain i'm thinking there is no god or <laughs> either that or god hates me or nice job god why could why don't you make the whole world like santa barbara <laughs> Or, you know, uh, Cotacachi, Ecuador. What's that? Some people hate that weather. I know a lot of people that can't stand weather above 75 degrees. Uh, well, actually, Santa Barbara rarely gets above 75 and rarely gets below 65. Too many people there. All that, why, why is that? It's because there's so few. There's like Santa Barbara, the Riviera, and then there's uh, the highlands in uh, the Andes Mountains. And that's pretty much it as far as like places with year-round spring weather. Every place else, you get like extremes of heat and cold, where you get like stifling humidity and heat in the summertime and freezing cold in the wintertime. And you get floods and tornadoes and hurricanes. And those hurricanes are not coming from the global warming. There is no such thing. Hurricanes have been around ever since there's been weather. And the hurricanes aren't happening with any increasing frequency. And the hurricanes come around every year and they wipe out property, they destroy houses. There's some guy, poor, poor guy that like went down a sinkhole. You know, it's like you get earthquakes and, and uh, it seems like if you, compare, uh, if you compare God to an architect, right? So sometimes like the Masons talk about God as being the grand architect of the universe. Well, the, the universe is it's sort of like a drafty house, like some house that's been built by some incompetent, right? The doors don't close all the way. It's drafty and cold in the wintertime, and it's hotter than hell in the summertime. It's got like creaky floorboards. Uh, the, you know, the, the pipes and the faucets drip all the time. The windows don't close all the way. You think about all the, the parts of the earth that, that are just like miserable and you know, really hostile to, to human beings. 
And so you think about, what about like, you know, the wonders of nature, right? So, you know, why is it that, that why do we need dentists, <laughs> right? Your teeth don't last forever. You go to like some Aboriginal culture and you get people, by the time they're like in their 60s, they're missing most of their teeth. Um, and I don't know if you've ever had like a really deep cavity, but it's like extremely painful. You gotta knock it out with a rock or pull it out with a piece of twine. I mean, imagine living at a time before modern dentistry, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, but you know, God designed those teeth, right? God designed all the diseases around. Like, you know, you live in the tropics, you get malaria, the dengue fever, just, uh, all sorts of horrible diseases. Polio, you know, used to, to cripple and, and kill people. Yeah. But there's also like all the plants pretty much heal everything. So he also, if you believe in a God, he also created the plants that heal things as well. Hmm. I mean, there are some things like, okay, well, I got a headache. Why? Because God screwed up in, in designing my vascular system and occasionally like it throbs and causes me pain. And then human beings figure it out, oh, if you take this willow bark and you mix it in a tea, it causes the pain to go away. I guess that's, that's something, but why does my head hurt in the first place? What's that? But even people that drink sufficient water and people that, that do all the right things, they have things, they get cancer. Yeah, and you can't cure cancer, cancer with herbs. Like my, my nephew got leukemia. And it wasn't from toxins in the, the water or whatever. You can, take, you can take rats and put them in a pristine, pristine natural environment. They still get cancer. Animals have always gotten cancer. Now maybe like some of the, the modern, some modern things might raise that rate up a little bit. Mostly what causes cancer today is smoking cigarettes and eating a, a heavy uh, meat diet, um, and, uh, high in, in animal fats. So sugar feeds the cancer cells too. Yeah, a large amounts of sugar might be true too. But you think about like the, the um, weakness, the weakness of, um, the human form. Well, the, but also meant to fall apart before we die. <laughs> I mean, why can't I die with all my teeth? <laughs> why can't I die without like having a stroke? Like there was a guy in our department, he had a heart attack, his second heart attack. And you know, I mean, he has a high stress job, I suppose. And But you know, why does he have a high stress job? His job was like, I think he interviewed children who'd been molested by their parents. So that's a high stress job, right? And he was working for the district attorney. And so I think that would be, you know, a, and then he like you retired and, and went to part-time teaching, which is a little less stressful. But you know, he's, he's getting up in years, I think he's in the 60s and he has a heart attack. Um, and, then, and then he has a, he, he you know, does all the, his doctor, you know, puts him on some drugs and, and gives, and he's got a good diet and exercise and so on. And then he has another heart attack, right? And then, then you get people that have strokes and heart disease and cancer. I mean, all these diseases and they start coming in in middle ages or in middle age. And, and uh, it's not like you just die quietly in your sleep by the time you hit a certain age. Your body kind of falls apart. And it's a kind of a painful, arduous process. I've got like a, um, so my, let's see, I've got actually lots of friends of relatives that have Alzheimer's or dementia, and it's sometimes it's hard to know which one it is where your brain gradually goes. Well, you know, if God designed the brain, why does it all sort of fall apart? And why do some people lose their memory and lose their sense of who they are? See, uh, see what I say, it's so hard to believe in God and designer when you go take philosophy classes. <laughs> well, there you go, yeah, coming back <laughs> to that. And this gets a little more into the problem of evil. Um, but think about like the ecosystem, right? Um, what does the ecosystem run on? Combination of systems. Um, need, fear, pain, and death. Um, I'm sure they give a good example of uh, 
Could you imagine what it would be like to be eaten alive? <laughs> like to, to be like knocked down by some wild animal and to have, feel the animal's teeth tearing into your soft underbelly and pulling out chunks of your flesh and your intestines being pulled out in front of your eyes and thrashing around trying to get away, but uh, realizing that, that, you know, that you probably wouldn't be able to. So that happens like every day in the jungles, right? You get some zebra and maybe he's a little slower than the rest of the zebras, right? And you have these animals and they're prey animals and they chase down the, the slowest zebra. Maybe he's a little old. Maybe it's like a young, uh, like a young, uh, uh, you know, a juvenile. Knock them, lock him down, you know. And sometimes it'll be a quick merciful death, death if, if like the, the animal goes for the jugular first. But often what they'll do is they'll sort of pin him down and you see this animal thrashing and kicking its feet and it goes for the soft underbelly and just takes a big bite out of uh, the animal's gut and tears it. And those teeth are like intended to, to tear, right? And, and, and eats the animal alive. And this happens in nature every day, animals eating other animals. Do you think those animals feel? <laughs> what what you know, they have nerve endings they have the same sensations we do animals feel fear animals feel need think about all the cold little kittens out there in the world that god's doing nothing about right think about like you think oh some people like the we this kind of weather well i'll guarantee you that all the feral cats out there in eugene they're hating this weather right now yeah, feral people too, I guess. Right, <laughs> but but the um, but the stay sick with the cute little kittens for a minute. Yeah. So like my wife feeds these uh, feral cats. You know, if she wasn't feeding them, they would have lives of want and deprivation. They might survive, they might not. But she feeds them. You know, we have like a little dog house in the the backyard with a little you know blanket in there for for them to go into when it gets cold to sort of huddle down. They find a place under our deck. It's more than God's done for him, right? God just says, oh, survive. I gave you a fur coat that will like keep you warm most of the time, but if it gets really wet or if it gets like drops below freezing, you're gonna be miserable for a while. And then it's like, and then you'll wait for summer and night, and so you get like three months of happiness. And if that cat still anything, then it's going to help. And then think, yeah. Well, <laughs> Think about like actually we we have some indoor cats too right maybe here I have cats as household pets so what what does that cat do if what would a cat do if it like got a hold like a mouse or a rabbit it plays, with it. plays with it right it's fun and basically shows slowly tortures that little animal to death right yes. and you know and 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 for the cat it's fun it's like swipe 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 <laughs> with the claws and or if it gets like a little bird uh, slashing with its claws and it waits till the animal like stops moving and if it stops moving it pokes it a little bit and you think what a horror and the cat doesn't know what's going on the cat isn't taking cystic pleasure in, in the animal but it's you know programmed through its design to enjoy slowly killing animals why because it teaches it hunting skills that it needs in the wild to catch the the mouse or the rat or what have you that's where play behavior actually evolves from the need to develop hunting skills. That's why you. That's why you love playing the Doom and the the whatever you got going. The World of Warcraft, right? You know, that's like that's like your primitive hunter gatherer. You know, instincts again, saying, "Hey, let's uh, do a sim run a simulation of how to catch something so I can eat, so I won't starve to death." Mm -hmm. And so, as a you think about what kind of God would create the scorpion and the snake and the, the parasite. And the uh, what's that? And diseases, right? Uh, like uh, you know, as I think about the really horrible ones, but I suppose you could like like Lou Gehrig's disease, or think about like you get the um, that that uh, flesh-eating bacteria. We're we're like pretty much cancer to this world, though, to the earth, like as a bacteria to, to, that does natural things to try and eliminate us. Yeah, what's the happening? I don't know. Have you ever seen that movie? <laughs> well, I was just about, yeah, that seems like a, like a value judgment. Like, it, does the earth have consciousness? Does the earth know we're here? It has little things on it. Yeah, but I don't think that the earth, like, the earth, it's not like the earth's trying to get rid of us or the earth is even a living thing. It has living things on it. 
I don't know about that. Like human beings is a cancer. I'm not sure what that means. It seems like it's a value judgment. Like human beings are bad. We just, need to get, I don't know. We just, we've just been destroyed. A lot of the beings on our planet, a whole bunch of things just destroyed. That have naturally been there and naturally occur there. And things like fires or, you know, tsunamis. I mean, those are natural things that wipe us out. But why have we been doing that? It's because, hey, you need a fire to keep warm. <laughs> Because you need to build houses so so life doesn't suck when you're living in these northern latitudes. So we're trying to adapt just like every other animal does using the best tools we know how. Human beings also replanted a lot, a great great deal of forest, preserved species, and so on. So I, I don't know if I agree that we've destroyed the planet. So apparently that's all we have time for. Uh, although I don't hear the music yet, but I'm sure we're close. So there it is. I hear it now. So. I, so uh, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Uh, no, it's open right now. Lane Online. Learn.